Broccoli cheddar soup in a bread bowl is just about as fun as it gets for soup, and it's totally possible to make an amazing version of it at home. Today, I'm gonna show you how. To get started on the bread bowl, I'm gonna grab a medium bowl and into that measure, 360 grams of warm water, three grams of instant yeast, 15 grams of white distilled vinegar. This vinegar helps us mimic the acidity that we would get from a sourdough starter without having to maintain one. Maybe that's why the people who invented the bread bowl with broccoli cheddar soup also use vinegar in their quote, sourdough. Another cheat that we're gonna use here is the lazy man's bread starter. That's 110 grams of ripe poolish. That's gonna bring more fermented flavor like a sourdough would, but for way less work. To make this poolish, I mix together 55 grams of warm water, a small pinch of instant yeast, 55 grams of bread flour. I stirred it together and let it ferment on my counter for 12 to 24 hours. 24 hours later, we have a very flavorful bread starter that's going to bring a nice yeasty depth of flavor to this bread. Once the poolish is all in, I'm going to add in 550 grams of bread flour and 11 grams of salt. Now, using a sturdy spoon, I'm going to stir everything up in the bowl to combine for about 20 to 30 seconds or until I've got a clumpy wad of partially hydrated flour like this. To finish mixing, I'm going to switch over to a soaking wet hand and continue to mix until everything is well combined and the dough is no longer clumpy. But what about a stand mixer? Well, you definitely could use that instead, but I would mix it the same amount. That is to say that the dough is fully combined, but it's not really strong at all. Personally, I prefer to hand mix this dough because it's simpler and we're going to be folding it anyway, so it doesn't need a mechanical mix. Once we're lump free like this, I'm going to pop a lid on the bowl and come back to check on it in 30 minutes. 30 minutes later, the dough has risen a little bit, but it's still a shaggy mess. So in order to bring some order to this chaos, I'm going to do a strength building fold. For that, I'm going to pull out one side as far as it will let me go, and then I'm going to fold the dough back over itself like this. I'll repeat this three more times for four folds in total, then I'll switch over to a slap and fold rounding move where I grab a corner of the dough, fold it in half while rotating and tucking it to create a nice taut little ball. The extra protein in the bread flour that we're using here should make this strength building step a lot easier. Now, the lid goes on. I'm going to ferment this for 30 more minutes. At this point, the dough is 60 minutes old, and it's quite a bit more gassed up. I'll repeat the folds that we just did again, the exact same as before. Now we've got a very strong, well-developed dough that's going to easily hold the shape of a bowl when we bake it. The lid goes on and I'll ferment it for one more hour. One hour later or two hours since we mixed this thing, the dough is all gassed up. It's buoyant and alive. I'd say it's grown by about 75% from where we started. Now to shape this, I'm going to flour my dough, then my board, and then I'm going to flip it out of the bowl. To divide it, I'm going to grab my gram scale and then cut the dough into four. 250 gram size pieces, or just feel free to eyeball it without the scale. Once I've got four equal ish size pieces ready to go, I'm going to grab a piece of parchment paper to land the dough on once it's shaped. To shape this, I'm going to start by degassing the dough. If there's too many large pockets of gas in a strong dough like this, they tend to blow up and deform the final product when we bake it. Now, I'm going to begin by pulling out the sides until I meet a little bit of tension, and then I'll fold the sides back into the center. Each time I pull a new fold into the middle, I'll poke it down to make it stick, and in total, I'm going to pull back and tuck seven to eight times or until I've got a little dough dumpling like this. From there, I'm gonna flip the ball over onto that seam and then use the palms of my hands and the tips of my fingers to roll this even tighter. Once that's shaped over to the parchment it goes, I'll shape the rest of these loaves and then I'm gonna proof these, but not on my pizza steel because it's quite cold, like 67 degrees F, and that will totally zap the energy out of my dough. So I'm gonna move this over to my cutting board, which is a much better insulator, and then I'm gonna cover it with a tall square foil pan that I got at the grocery store. I'll link to this one in the description for your reference because it's pretty specific, but it's pretty awesome. Then I'm going to set these dough balls off to the side and let them proof for 60 to 90 minutes. While those rise, let's prep the veg for this soup. I'm going to start with one whole white onion. In recent videos, I've gone with a simpler two-step method for chopping onions, and that method remains my everyday move, but when I need a very small diced onion, the traditional three-step slice, slice, chop is the way to go. For a soup like this, I want my onions more melted into the background as opposed to being a large, chunky piece in every bite. So for me, small is the way to go. In total, I need 250 grams. The next veggie is fennel or the rich man's celery, as I like to call it. Just kidding, they taste super different, but if you didn't have fennel, celery could be a good sub here. I'm using the same three-step slice, slice, chop maneuver for the fennel. In total, I need 125 grams small diced. That's roughly one whole small bulb of fennel. Behind the fennel, I'm gonna mince six cloves of garlic. There's really nothing to note here, just keep it on the small side. And then behind that, I'm gonna cut one large carrot. In this soup, carrots fall into the garnish category instead of the aromatic flavor base category like onions, fennel, and garlic. That means that I want larger chunks of carrot in every bite. So I'm going to cut them like this, which I would consider relatively large. 
125 grams total. Behind that, I'm gonna grab two small Yukon gold potatoes and cut them the same way. The original Mall Cafe version doesn't have potatoes in it, to the best of my knowledge, but I really like the nice creamy starchiness that they bring, and that added starch will actually help keep the cheese properly emulsified later on. Lastly, but most importantly, is the broccoli. I'm gonna start by removing the stem, and then I'll cut the crown top to bottom from the florette through the base to get a narrow strip of broccoli. I like to slice these pieces in half to create baton type shapes, and then I'll turn them 90 degrees and dice them into roughly the same size pieces as we did for the carrot and the potato. All three of these together are gonna be the textural elements of the soup, and in total, I need 375 to 400 grams of medium diced broccoli. Once I've got all that chopped up, I'm gonna assemble my cut vegetables and then move them out of the way while I thank the sponsor of this video, Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon is an adult cereal that is delicious in the same way sugary child cereals are, but it's actually healthy. How is that possible? Every serving has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net carbs. In addition to that, Magic Spoon is gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, and keto-friendly. That's like all of the stuff that boring adults like me are looking for in a cereal. Throw in a healthy dose of childhood nostalgia and a maze on the back, and I literally can't think of a better product for a 34 year old man who is relatively health conscious. As far as flavors go, they've got cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, and they've also got cookies and cream, maple, waffle, and cinnamon. My favorite right now is definitely the frosted. So if you like good tasting cereal, but don't want the sugar, try Magic Spoon by clicking the link in my description and using code Brian Lagerstrom at checkout. When you do that, you'll get $5 off when you build your own variety box. And if you aren't fully satisfied, Magic Spoon will refund you 100%. Hey, Bri, what if you live in Canada and or the UK. Well, Magic Spoon just started shipping there, so congratulations. Again, to get $5 off your variety pack, use the link in my description and code Brian Lagerstrom at checkout. Thank you, Magic Spoon. Time to check back on the bread bowls. These have been proofing for about 90 minutes, and I know it's properly proofed when I give it a poke and the dough feels light and buoyant and just barely springs back after my touch. To get these ready to bake, I'm going to split the parchment into four quadrants so that I can move the loaves around individually as needed. This is especially important about halfway through the bake, and you'll see why. Next, I'm going to give these proofed up loaves 10 to 12 sprays of water from my squirter like this. That water on the outside is going to turn to steam when these bake, and that's going to give us a pro level crust. The last thing I'll do before I bake these is to use my serrated knife to score a little cross into the top of each loaf. This creates a weak spot for the dough to rise through, and without it, we would have bread that is significantly less risen and probably a little bit underbaked in the middle. Once all four of these are scored, I'm going to grab my pizza peel and scoot all of them onto that. The oven behind me was pre heated about 30 minutes earlier to 460F, 240C, and at that time, I loaded my pizza steel in to get it preheated as well. Since I've got these loaves on individual parchments, I can scoot them closer to each other so that they can fit under the lid that I'm about to drop. A few more squirts of water to ensure maximum steamage, then the foil pan that I used to cover these during the proof is going to get dropped, and I'll bake them covered for 15 minutes. While those bake, let's make the soup. For that, I'm going to grab my 6.5 quart Dutch oven and preheat it over medium-high heat. Once that's hot, in goes 75 five grams of extra virgin olive oil. And once that's hot, in goes my onions, fennel, garlic, carrot, potato, and then broccoli. The whole lot is gonna get a strong pinch of salt and then I'll stir it to get everything cooking. You'd usually cook the aromatic vegetables like the onions and garlic first and then add your garnish vegetables, but I tried it that way and it gave me the same result as this way, but it took 10 minutes longer. So everything goes in at the same time. After about six to eight minutes of sweating these vegetables over medium high heat, they've lost some of their moisture and they're just starting to get softened. The next thing in is gonna be 50 grams of flour. This is gluten-free flour, by the way, because Lauren is gluten-free and I really wanted her to try the soup, but all-purpose flour would be a one-to-one -one sub here. The gluten is not what does the thickening, it's the starch. Now we're technically making a roux, and that roux is going to team up with the potatoes that we've got in there to sort of lock the fat in from the cheese so that we don't get an oily, broken, disgusting, trash-ass soup later on. Once that flour has been well stirred in and has been cooked enough to lose a little bit of its raw edge, in goes 1,500 grams of store-bought chicken stock followed by 250 grams of heavy cream. That's actually not a ton of heavy cream for a soup like this because in my my opinion too much dairy fat makes things taste boring so i'm only using the minimum dose here required to bring a silky body to the background of this soup once that's stirred in, I'm going to reduce the heat to medium low and let the veggies cook and the roux do its thickening thing for about 10 more minutes. Back to the bread. It's been baking for about 15 minutes under the foil pan, and now I'm going to take that off, but I'm going to be very careful in the process because there's a bunch of steam escaping and it can be very, very hot. 
These look amazing though. They've risen quite a bit and all the steam in there has given them a well gelatinized shiny exterior. Now I'm gonna rotate these and spread them out a little bit so that they can continue to bake evenly. And I'm gonna bake them for about 20 more minutes. Back at the stovetop, the roux has provided a small but meaningful amount of thickening to the base of the soup and the veggies have gotten nice and tender. The best way to confirm that is to either pop a few pieces of veg into your mouth and let your teeth decide or to see how these things smash against the side of the pot. Either way, these look good. Everything's tender, but it's not mushy and that's what I like. Now I'm gonna turn the heat down to its lowest setting and let the soup hang out for a few seconds while I pull out the bread. After 35 minutes in total in the oven, these bread bowls look super sick. And just like the big dog loaf from the one dough, three loaves video, this bread also sings as it cools. These are gonna be very cool vehicles for soup. To finish that soup, I'm gonna grab a high sided pot and a ladle, then I'm gonna scoop out about three to four cups of the soup base, then I'll scoot the bread out of the way and then in goes my immersion blender. From there, I'm gonna puree it for 20 to 30 seconds or until the soup base has gotten smooth and green like this. Having a little bit of pureed vegetable in the background of the soup is gonna boost the flavor and having the potatoes in there is gonna combine with the roux to provide excellent protection to keep that cheese from breaking. Speaking of cheese, once that puree is mixed in with the base of the soup, I'm gonna add in 225 grams of medium sharp cheddar cheese. Feel free to experiment with the cheddar cheese of your choice, but know that the more aged and sharp a cheese is, the trickier it will be to keep stable in hot soup. Once all that cheese is stirred in and it's looking good, now let's take a closer look. As you can see, the background of the soup has a really nice body to it, but it's not gloppy or overly thickened, and there's plenty of tender, chunky vegetable bits in there to keep things interesting texturally. The final and probably most important step in soup making is to thoughtfully taste the final product for seasoning. Most home cooks don't know it, but they're probably not using enough salt and you really need to taste your food to see if it is as optimally delicious as it could be. I think this could use a few more pinches of salt. I'll stir that in. And yeah, that tastes real dope. Now to build this soup, I'm gonna grab a bread bowl. And again, look at how caramelized and shiny that crust is. Amazing. Now using a pointy knife, I'm gonna cut a uniform hole around the top about two inches deep. Save that plug too, that's the dipper right there. Once it tops off, I'm gonna come back and rip out most of the inside of this loaf. Make sure you leave some in there around the edges because when those get all sogged up with broccoli cheddar soup, that's gonna be some of the best bites of the entire day. Now I can comfortably fit about six ounces of soup into one of these bowls. Any more than that would be a lot in my opinion. I'm definitely gonna eat the entire bowl itself and at a minimum, that is the same amount of food as a 12 inch pizza. Now to garnish this, I'm gonna to top it with a ton of fresh cracked black pepper and some additional sharp cheddar cheese. You guys, broccoli cheddar soup in a bowl made out of bread is just a classic and there's no reason you can't make the world's best version of it yourself at home. The bread is fresh and the soup is hearty and rich, but bright and in balance. I hope you guys give it a try soon. Let's eat this thing.